Okay, I think we're leveling off a little bit there. So, hello and welcome to today's webinar. For a UK economic success story, we need only to look beneath the, beneath the waves. Through its roots in the oil and gas industry, defence and transmission, the UK has established itself as an underwater technology pioneer with about approximately 40% market share in global underwater energy sector. As the energy transition accelerates towards renewables, there is an opportunity to push UK businesses into more global markets. In today's webinar, we hosted by the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, we're going to have a mix of in-house experts as well as guest speakers to introduce today's topics. First on the agenda, we're going to cover multiple cutting edge areas of research underway in our research labs and hubs. Then we're going to look at potential for disruptive insurance for the subsea market, particularly uh, transmission owners off those. That's going to be about quarter to three. We're going to look at new technologies for failure prediction being developed by three different leading technology developers. That's at about quarter past three. And then we'll be wrapping up at about quarter to four. You will get your chance today to put questions to speakers directly, but also in Ori Catapult's LinkedIn page using the hashtag CablesQuestions. This will open up after the event, not right now. So please answer, um, send as many questions as you can. We'll get through as many as we can. As a little bit of background, it's not hugely important, but I'm Dan Sumner. I'm a regional partnership manager at Ori Catapult. And my role is to go and go to various conferences and speak to people to be able to find industry pain points and then go out there, find people with great new services, technologies to be able to alleviate those, those pain points. Um, this webinar, will be recorded on YouTube um, and we'll be taking questions in the days after the event on our LinkedIn page as well. Like I said, hashtag cables questions. Hopefully this event will give you an insight into some of the cable innovation research underway at Uri Catapult and also around the wider subsea cable community. We're going to cover areas of academic research with our partners at the University of Manchester and in the same section we're going to look in a bit more depth at um, technologies uh, and materials projects underway at our own high voltage lab and test facilities. After that, we're going to look at disruptive innovation model for the offshore wind industry, the potential for mutual insurance, and then we're going to look at new technologies for failure prediction being developed by three leading technology developers. Each of those sections has got its own Q&A. Um, we'll be putting as many questions to the panel as time allows, but you're welcome to move a question to social media. So enough, uh, enough of me. Um, let's open, I think, with the presentations now for key areas of research. So we're going to be looking at uh, questions, challenges, uh, initiatives around failure modes, around the challenges to do dynamic cables, uh, the wider challenges around collecting data uh, and, and recording of, of cable failure, and then also around asset management. The first of these topics or, or challenges is presented by Alex Newman, who's head of our high voltage lab at Ori Catapult. As a very brief introduction, Alex has worked at Ori for over six years. Um, and before that, 10 years uh, across, um, working across the world as a consultant to the power industry. Alex has advised regulators, uh, power system owners and government agencies on issues ranging across power system operations, regulation, investment planning, and expenditure modeling. He's carried out technology reviews, feasibility and analysis and power system design and planning work over his career, and I think he's going a little bit red. So let's just pass over to, to Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Can you hear me? Just check that everything's on. And can you see? Great. Um, thank you for that introduction, Dan. Um, thanks for having me to speak as well. Um, as introduced, my name is Alex Newman. I'm the business and technical manager um, for the high voltage um, systems part of the offshore renewable energy catapult. Um, just a bit of background to us here. Um, we we run big test facilities um, for high, high voltage cable systems, um, amongst other equipment. Um, so we test a lot of cables. We have materials lab that analyze and characterize the materials that are comprised parts of the, the cable systems. Um, we also offer power systems analysis and failure investigation services um, that includes root cause investigations. So a lot of the, the stuff um, I'll be talking about today is almost set in the context for the, the rest of the, the seminar this afternoon, but delighted to be talking to you. So I'll press on and get my timer going. Um, let's just see that these are working. 
Okie dokes. Um, submarine cables are not new. Um, these are some of the oldest pictures I could get my hands on, but we've been installing submarine cables for more than 100 years. Um, so one might ask yourself, why are we talking about failures today? Um, they've been around for a while, um, but I think the, the context has shifted. We're putting a lot more out there. The power, the power density in the offshore system is going up. The, the voltage levels are going up. So there's a, there's a lot of a higher use case there. Um, power density is driving, um, driving lower margins, you can call it that, in, um, in operating experience and, and um, design of high voltage kit offshore. Um, these pictures are, these graphs on this slide are taken from a, a useful report um, released in 2019 showing the failure rates on export cable systems, so transmission cables specifically um, related to offshore wind um, projects around Europe. Um, I think the, the things to note on here are very much the, the average here, which is 0 0.003 failures per kilometer per year. And one can see that these are the, what's shown on this graph is the, 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 the projects that have actually experienced failures. There is a long list of projects, um, I think longer than those listed on here that hadn't actually experienced failures. So this, is, this can be taken out of context possibly, but what this is showing is that the, the farms that do um, realize problems with the export cables are not the majority, um, but when they do have problems, they are big problems. Um, and that's that piece of analysis, that, piece of, that good piece of work um, calculated failure rates back in 2018, 2019, and um, concluded that the, the AC wind farm export connection, specifically the failure rate, um, is about three to four times um, what was predicted um, based on historical evidence from an um, organization like Seagray that runs um, cable failure statistics once every few years, um, predominantly based on um, not submarine cables, on land cables, um, given that context. But what it does show is that the submarine cable failure experience for offshore wind specifically is um, a lot more extreme than was expected. More context setting really when things go wrong, um, they cost a lot of money. If you look at the first uh, the first table at the top here, these are publicly available costs taken from a report that you can find at the, the link below in, in blue. Um, another useful report, um, but tens of millions of pounds to repair, just to repair um, the, the next uh, the next paragraph there, if you include the cost of constrained generation during the fault finding repair and putting right, that, so the, the whole repair context, it magnifies that repair cost quite dramatically. And then more points to note really about time and the impact of time and that links in obviously with lost generation, um, average 38 days to repair an array cable and 62 days to repair an export cable. You can see that's the reason why the, the costs rack up um, over the, you know, associated with a, a failure. So um, I guess that's context set, some of it. Um, just um, realize that a lot of people on this, listening in on this will know this also. Apologies if, if I'm, um, <laughs> repeating what everyone knows already, but um, three core power cables offshore. Um, put my little catapult mug on top of a typical export cable there. Um, that's the bigger, obviously the, the bigger type of cable, um, quite a bit bigger than array cables. But this just generally here, the picture on the left shows the topology of a typical submarine cable. Um, three power cores with the three phases of voltage being transmitted um, and a bundled what, yeah, one or more bundles of fiber optic um, cables that are used for comms and control um, through the power system, um, all bundled together and protected with uh, various plastic and armor layers, steel armor layers. Um, point to note on this that is relevant to the rest of this presentation certainly is not the, the cores are not the only part of the cable to carry current as some people who don't know cables that well might think. Obviously the core carries the direct current, the power transmission between A to B between turbines or between substation to shore. Um, but there are induced currents flowing, um, predominantly generated by magnetic interaction with those power cores. Um, power flow uh, 
low voltage generally, but um, you get significant currents flowing in the, the screen layers. Um, what's not shown on here is sometimes you do get um, metallic layers beyond the screen as well. Um, most times you do actually, um, that can transmit current as well. That would be induced from the cores and the armoring will carry some small currents as well. But um, the screen, the, the, the layer under the, the steel tube underneath the armoring of the fiber optic carries induced currents as well as a result of the interaction and due to its position within the power core bundle. So that's really all that that was intended to display. The next uh, slide here is very much um, cable system. It's not just a cable um, for those who aren't in <laughs> working in detail with cables. And um, there's a lot to a cable system. From left to right here, we have onshore terminations, a number of joints along the underground cable section similar joints at the interface between the onshore and the offshore section of the power cable system. Then we move offshore under the waves. Um, you can get factory joints if, um, if they are needed to make the longer lengths of cable. If factories can't produce long enough in, in one run, and we need to have factory joints made in, in factories, but spilled, um, spilled onto the boat as a, as a cable. Um, repair joints later in life if repair joints come along and then I have, couldn't fit them on the drawing, but certainly substation transition joints, offshore substation terminations, they're all part of the cable system. Now, sea gray guidelines aren't there that were written uh, many years ago um, for submarine cables state that you should test all accessories as part of um, a submarine cable system, or sorry, not a submarine cable system, as a cable system. Um, now that's uh, the ideal ways that you would do type testing and pre-qualification testing with all of the accessories included in that. But um, with the amount of projects that are going out there, um, there's a lot of variety out there and not always is this carried out with the complete cable system to our experience. Onto the root causes of cable system failures. I think if we can just have a quick look at the top right corner there to start with, um, the, the breakdown of these um, issues of the, the root causes really, um, about half related to installation, only under 10% related to external damage. And that's a point to note. I think um, the misconception might be out there sometimes that um, it's external events like fishermen and anchor dragging and things like that that might cause the, the problems, but it's not. Um, cable design fault and manufacturing um, issues that are related to other failure, um, the, the remainder. Um, if we just go through the, the text there, really, um, it breaks down installation um, issues at the beginning. Well, obviously, load out an installation from the manufacturing, but can be issues with the cable protection systems. Bearing in mind, we're working offshore in rough conditions, rough wet conditions with um, big equipment offshore. Things can go wrong, which can re um, relate to overbending and over tensioning of the cable. Um, and then also site installation um, from a um, termination perspective, these are common issues that do get encountered there. Usually get picked up early on in the lifetime of the cable, usually at the commissioning test stage. Um, but if they're not picked up at that stage, obviously they turn into operational issues. Um, interface design issues sometimes can take longer to embed. Um, interfaces between accessories at T connectors of array cables, joints, terminations the connectors onto the switch gear in the turbine but also um, at accessories within the cable system so at um, factory joints repair joints things like that um, wherever there's an interface there is an opportunity for things to go wrong um, operational issues once again when you go further into the lifetime of the cable then the fatiguing can become an issue and this is something that has been in the press recently um, and you know it's there's going to be more of that to come really as when, when projects um, earn a, a lifetime and um, we learn exactly how expensive and how much work is involved in maintaining them, but very much around um, low amplitude, long duration um, fatigue effects of cables when they become unburied or when they are just uncovered um, at the bottom of the turbine um, due to turbulence around the turbine tower. So those are issues and the, the bottom one, obviously manufacturing and design defects that um, a relatively large um, proportion of the, the problems, but I think that that does also 
tell you that you know we are relatively early stages of product life cycle here um, and i'll get onto that a little bit later on but a point to to make here as well is could be pro provocative i suppose but you know with the, the amount of lab testing we do on both export and array cables um, we get the impression that you know offshore wind has been challenged with cost reduction targets to make it feasible and we've been through a big cost reduction trajectory um, which has been a success but what it has done is it's driven down um, the technical the, the margin built into cable systems design um, which has led to more sensitive products um, don't take that the wrong way they they all put you know they, they do pass their type tests and the pre-qualification testing and all that sort of thing but i think the point needs to be made that the margins are being squeezed and you know the designs are getting tight um, so I should have mentioned the previous slide was was specific to array cables. This one's more on the export cables. Um, it, again, just looking at root causes, installation areas, installation effects similar to the array cables, but amplified really because of a larger product that is harder to install and much longer. Um, over tensioning, over bending obviously goes along with that. Um, operational fatigue related damage if you do get deburied sections, uh, manufacturing deep defects. I think it's been well publicized over the last few years about the fiber optic cable armor package um, issues that have led to failures on a number of wind farms. Um, and again, external effects. If you do get deburied cables, um, they can affect the, the performance and the lifetime. Um, design issues. Um, what we've noticed here with the testing that we do and um, once again on export cables as well um very much interfaces between cables and accessories are obviously weak points um and interface between onshore and offshore um the, the interesting bit about that is that there's usually a contractual break or there can be a contractual break between the onshore and the offshore contract so when these projects are being de delivered and developed um there's a contractual change there, which makes it difficult to, to interface and to, to line up tests and things like that um, between those two. So just an interesting perspective really from our side. Um, that's not only is there a technical challenge, but there can be a contractual challenge there as well. Now, moving away from the root causes, um, failure mechanisms um, that result from the root causes. Generally things when they are allowed to um, develop into proper faults, the, the result is a failure of the HV insulation system, which is the, obviously the bit between the core and the, the earth on the outside. Um, you can get pure HV insulation related defects and mechanisms that turn into those faults. So imperfect, imperfections and in interfaces, damage during manufacturing and damage during installation. It's, it's relatively not uncommon anyway. Um, HV insulation failure results. Thermal overload, whether it's not tightening up the connections right, um, loosening due to vibration, local hotspots at interfaces. Once again, HV insulation failure if it's allowed to develop to that. And I think the pictures on the right, really, they're showing various stages of decay of power insulation um, with different external effects working their way inwards. But I think point to note on those, those pictures that look pretty dramatic is those cables were still operating and that wasn't the point of failure. Or oh, sorry, these weren't failed cables actually um, that were were um were looked at so you know these cables are pretty resilient but you obviously don't want to be doing that to them it will reduce their lifetime um dramatically um induced effects uh, i think going back to the um the induced effects popping back to my second slide where i was talking about the the non-primary current carrying conductors on a cable system these cause a lot of problems obviously the outer layers are the first to get damaged whether it's during manufacturing installation or operation um, and if you mess with those and they are carrying current and they do break, they do corrode. As soon as you get a break, you get arcing heat um, and collateral damage, which can result in insulation failure with time. And that would be the end of that, um, requiring a repair. I think looking ahead, um, I reflected on this briefly earlier, but um, we are at a relatively early stage in offshore winds. Um, operational learning still the curve on the top right there shows um, over the years from 2004 to current time the installed capacity um, and if you can look um, most of the installed capacity has been installed over the, the last 10 years really so um, we're not you know we're not yet halfway through the majority of the, the installed capacity's life yet and um, we, we're very much only learning about the, the operational aging and fatiguing 
issues that will be experienced over the coming 10 to 20 years, really. Um, and yeah, the picture on the bottom right really is about a lot of work that we've got in the labs at the minute is trying to characterize cable aging and um, the effects that that has on um, lifetime extension opportunities and um, just predicting the end of life of cable systems. Improvements, uh, I'll skip through these. I realize I'm taking too long already. Um, design issues, material selection can be improved based on operational experience. Interface design, that's a big thing. Improved dynamic performance, that's a big thing as well. These are you know, specified as static cables, but we're learning that dynamic interaction um, and dynamic action does age them and break them. Um, cable protection system improvements, that, that's important too. Um, better and representative testing, obviously that's close to my heart. Um, always intrigued that the, the fact that we don't do thermal stability tests on cables before they, um, as part of the type test, you, you would do that typically on most other power system products. Um, it's something I'm an advocate of and would recommend for any type test to go above and beyond what the standards are saying. Um, and the, the last point there really is um, fatigue testing. Do we need it on static cables? Because that is um, leading to um, some aging effects and failures um, and premature end of life um, at the minute. Uh, operational improvements in the operational context, monitoring systems. I'll not step on Charlotte's toes when she's, she's going to be talking about electrode later, so I'll not say any more about that. Um, demonstration opportunities for new monitoring systems are needed so that we can retrofit and prove that they are useful and um, insurable. Um, innovative repair strategies, universal repair joints, pooled spares, shared maintenance contracts, that sort of thing. Um, I think most of you have probably heard a lot about that sort of thing already. Um, and retrospective <laughs> fatigue protection, like um, rock dumping and other remedial solutions are shown in the photos there. So that is it from me. I hope that provides the right context. And thank you very much for listening. That's brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. Um, I'm seeing the questions coming in, guys. Um, we're going to have a, a chance at the end of the session about 2.35. Um, so I'm going to try and organise those questions between between the speakers today uh, and, and we'll go through the questions there. Um, and yeah, it's good to see Alex then leading into some of the other topics being, being covered today. Um, next up, we've got Will, Will Brindley, uh, who's working on the challenges around dynamic cable reliability for floating wind. Will's a research engineer leading our dynamic cables projects in the floating offshore wind center of excellence. Before joining the Catapult at the end of last year, Will has led research projects for oil and gas industry and in the field of naval architecture. So, Hi, Will. Thank you, Dan. Can you hear me okay? All good. Excellent. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking about some of the, the research projects relating to cables, um, particularly the ones where we've been working with academic partners and industry partners to, to do some practical research, which we're hoping in the next few years will have an impact for the industry. So this is what we've been talking about. Um, we've got an array here of 30 50 megawatt turbines offshore. They're static monopiles and they've got cables stringing them together. So we've got about half a gigawatt of power here. And going into these turbines, we've got cables. Uh, they go through a J tube with a bend stiffener in this case. Um, and then they're connected. They've got the interface with the platform where eventually they go into the switch gear. Um, so that, that's what we're talking about with static foundations. Um, one research project we're looking at. What Alex has talked about is we most of the problems, um, particularly around the interface and the connection, um, around breakdown of the insulation. Um, a way you can pick up that problem or the breakdown is monitoring for partial discharge. Currently, uh, partial discharge is monitored through inductance or radio frequency techniques. Um, but what one project we've been working on with the University of Strathclyde is actually using acoustic emissions to pick up uh, partial discharge. Now with conventional materials, you can't pick up these discharges. So what we've been working on is uh, quite an innovative 3D printed piezoelectric structure, which is designed to be much more sensitive uh, in how it picks up uh, particular acoustic emissions. Um, the project is to design prototype and then full scale test these to be able to pick up uh, the emissions. And if we can succeed in doing this, we'll have a much lower cost, very scalable solution that can be 3D printed 
and can actually offer a higher sensitivity um, for long-term monitoring of these issues. So we can pick up problems earlier and cheaper. Uh, so that'd be quite an interesting project. Uh, we're hoping to get results uh, next year. So that's static cable. Now what about dynamic cables? There's a lot of talk about floating wind. Well, what changes? Well, we've got um, a structure that's not no longer fixed. It's subject to the action of waves, wind and current. And because of that, we have to make the, the power cable compliant. So in this case, we've got a lazy wave, um, very different from a static power cable, very limited experience to date with these, even though we're going to have potentially thousands of these cables in service over the next decade. Um, there's some learning from oil and gas that we can take, which have similar power cables, power umbilicals, um, but we're very much a new uh, domain here. Uh, so what does it look like? So at the top, we've got a bend stiffener where it connects to the platform. And then we've got the, the cable goes down through a lazy wave where it's supported by buoyancy elements, so, which are clamped to the cable. And then going down to the seabed touch, uh, touchdown where we've got abrasion um, and other uh, issues there. Uh, so this is the, the power cable cross section. What could possibly go wrong? Well, quite a lot, actually. Um, certainly looking at failure statistics for um, oil and gas umbilicals, uh, which have some power cable components in them. Um, it's not a perfect data set, but they look like they're certainly no better in terms of reliability um, than our fleet of static cables. So we could see issues we don't approach this properly. Um, one the thing that seems to fail most in these are the uh, current carrying components, so the cable cores. So that could be a key area of focus to make sure that these are resilient for dynamic stresses. Um, interestingly, a similar data set of um, oil and gas flexible risers, which have the armor wire but not the electrical components, actually have quite good reliability statistics. So almost a 10 times better reliability than the equivalent power umbilicals, which might tell us what we need to focus on uh, when we're looking at dynamic cables. Uh, to address some of these challenges, we have a floating wind center of excellence. The floating wind center of excellence is a consortium of 14 partners led by ORE, Catapult. Um, and the objective is really to accelerate uh, the commercialization of floating wind. And one of the key challenges is dynamic cables. We're running a, a project now on dynamic cables um, focused on what the UK requirements will be for those cables. So what does the design look like? What do they have in common? And actually, what don't we have at the moment that could reduce cost or improve reliability? And uh, running at the moment, we're looking at the UK supply chain um, and how ready the UK supply chain is to meet this demand or what we need to do to address this. Uh, and there will be a market projections report um, issued public domain at the end of the summer, we'll, which will give a summary of what these cables will look like, um, a shopping list and what the future market demand for these cables will be um, to, to help the supply chain to plan. And um, following an understanding that these cables might not be all that reliable, uh, we need new technology. We're looking at a next phase of technology development, looking at particular technologies and qualifying those and testing them to make sure that they're workable for these dynamic systems. Uh, so we have, that's one floater. What does an array look like? Well, it's not all that dissimilar from a fixed array, but it's um, a lot more congestion on the seabed. So each floater has at least three mirroring lines. Some of them might have six or even eight. Um, so we've got a lot more to think about when you're designing these array systems, looking for installability, but also maintainability as well. So we're working with a partner, Kinnewell, uh, who have a KLOC program um, for essentially doing a dot-to-dot -dot, uh, optimization of static arrays. So what's the, the best power cable arrangement that has the lowest capital, capital cost, but also the lowest maintenance and transmission losses. Um, so through this TIGOR funding, which is Technology, Innovation and Green Growth, um, we're looking to support Catapult to develop this program. One area of support is looking at how this static program can be adapted to the more complex arrangement of a floating array. Uh, so looking at how you can thread these power cables um, optimally between the platforms. So that, that's the, the floating wind array. As Alex mentioned, you need a inter-array uh, using medium voltage AC cable. So we're talking about maybe 66 to 132 kilovolts. 
And then that'll go to a substation and you have a much higher voltage to export the cable 100 odd kilometers back to shore. Um, as we go into deeper water, particularly worldwide, it'll no longer be feasible to have a fixed substation, which means a floating substation. And a floating substation means dynamic export cables. Uh, and that's a real challenge that the industry is facing. Uh, there is a carbon trust study ongoing on this subject. And to complement this, the, we're running a project with the Manchester University on electrical growth uh, through insulation, electrical tree growth, and looking at how uh, the tree growth is influenced by dynamic strain of the cable. So a dynamic export cable, uh, do we think it's more likely to fail because it's being strained in the wave cycles? Uh, so as part of this project, doing some laboratory scale tests, we're flexing a, a cable insulation sample. We'll develop a model for predicting tree growth. And then in our dynamic test rig, do a full scale test so we can understand this more and hopefully prevent a failure before it actually happens in service. That's the, the aim of all of this. And on that theme, um, so there's a natural progression and the further from shore you get, the more power you need to export, uh, particularly when you get over the, the one gigawatt mark. Um, and the, the 100 kilometer mark from shore, you go from a more typical AC export cable, which I, Alex showed you a cross section of, um, going into a higher voltage DC cable where you have much lower losses. But the downside of a DC cable is you have very expensive uh, infrastructure uh, to transmit uh, the DC uh, power. Um, and that might be an even bigger issue when we're talking about floating platforms and trying to engineer that for a DC cable. Um, so the next progression of that, as you get even more power, uh, is a superconducting cable. So Supernode are working on superconducting cables for offshore use. Uh, the idea is you can send a uh, relatively high te uh, temperature superconductor, but it's still cooled, so it, it's not very high temperature. Um, but the idea behind this cable is that you can send a very large amount of current at relatively low vo voltages with negligible losses. So then that opens up the potential to have a European grid where you're balancing the power produced from winds with the power produced from solar. And you can really have a much more optimal system if you embrace this on a larger scale. So some very promising technology. Um, to support that, we're running a research program with the University of Strathclyde um, on some of the design challenges and technology innovation. Um, recently published another part of this research program was a cost benefit analysis looking at a, a relatively high level, uh, high voltage DC system versus an equivalent superconducting system. And what that cost benefit analysis showed was actually these systems can even today be cost competitive with these DC systems. Um, and the finding of that was the, the highest cost benefit was a reduction of this very large infrastructure for converting to high voltage DC. Um, and in closing out, what well, that's what we're running at the moment. What we're looking at in the next year or so to run in terms of research. Well, dynamic cables are certainly a hot topic. Um, I think it's fair to say we don't fully understand how these might degrade in the future. We don't have the data set and there's some failure modes we don't particularly well understand. Um, so this will involve global modeling, local mechanical modeling on the cross section, um, but also electrical modeling. So Alex talked about well, what fails is actually the insulation that we have a lot of issues with. Um, we don't fully understand how insulation breakdown due to water treeing or treeing interacts with mechanical stresses. And there's another component here, which is cycling thermal stresses. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot to understand. So we're looking to do modeling. We then take those models and do tests to validate. Uh, and then we look at monitoring systems so we can understand through the life actually what's happened to these cables. So that'll be electrical monitoring but also optical monitoring through strain, vibration, and temperature. Then we take our models, our test data, and our monitoring signals through to life, and then we convert that into a digital twin. So the cable owners know exactly what's happening to their cable, and they can understand where they are in terms of reliability or life extension we're going to the future. Um, thank you. That's great. Thanks, Rob. Um, next up, we're, uh, we're now moving on to the data challenge. Uh, we have Charlotte Strang Moran, who's the lead engineer in a new electro program. Charlotte joined Ori Catapult as a graduate engineer in 2018 and has since made subsea cable a real niche. 
Um, she's worked in a variety of cable failure projects, publishing papers on their data gaps and failure modes in this area. So please, Charlotte, take it away. Hi, Dan, can you hear me okay? Yeah, can hear you great. Great, can you see my screen? Yes. Good, excellent. Okay, hello everyone and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today to hear about some of the activities uh, that is currently uh, happening in and around the cable sector. I will be sharing with you today our work on the Electro Project, a platform for electrical cable failure trending and reliability analysis for operational offshore wind developments. Offshore wind is a growing industry. Our forecast assumes a near term push to achieve 2030 targets with annual installations increasing from around 8 gigawatts in 2020 to 28 gigawatts in 2030 and an amazing 35 gigawatts in 2050. This isn't just in one part of the world either. Across the globe, we are seeing the market grow. As wind farms increase in power capacity and size, we expect that the cable systems will be able to carry the power across the collector grid to our substations and to shore and to be reliable and efficient. Subsea cable failure is a growing issue in offshore wind. As technology adapts and offshore wind develops, subsea cables are required to become more reliable, yet cable failure is still regularly occurring and insurance claims are on the rise. We are seeing cables across the interiority system and export system failing due to manufacturing defects, miscalculated design, as well as installation errors, costing millions when cables are only around 10% of the project capex. Cable claims under the construction policy are about 40% in number of all claims made to insurers, as well as being about 80% of claimed costs paid by insurers to the project. Of these costs, about 65% are attributed to vessel costs. Although some of these failures can be left dormant and can affect also the operational phase of the wind farm, as well as manufacturing and design defects. The project Electrical Cable Failure Trending and Reliability Analysis for Operational Developments, also known as Electrode, will measure and track cable issues in an anonymous and secure way to provide the evidence required for improvement. Electrode aims to bridge the gaps between businesses, provide regular up-to-date industry-backed evidence, and reduce the volume of cable failures through reducing uncertainty and encouraging innovation to tackle key reliability challenges. Our vision is to improve the representation of subsea cable failures and incidents in the sector to support the industry and to reduce costs and improve cable reliability. We have been working to gauge the interest from industry, from OEM, insurance and service companies across the sector to owner operators. This has been ongoing much longer than my time at the Caspult, and we've seen a shift in recent years which has shown us that the industry is looking to combat the challenge of limited data in the offshore wind cable sector. Ori Catapult have been in discussion with various stakeholders in the sector, from owner operators to manufacturing and insurance, for technical knowledge and input from as many influencing members of the cable sector as possible, to ensure that the inputted data and the trends and analysis from Electrode are the most beneficial to the industry. We are now developing the platform and working towards owner operator expressions of interest to go towards eventual sign up and data collection. So this is our vision of how the platform will work. We have used this information to scope our latest development plan. Tier 1 provides a dashboard for organisations of operational developments to compare their industry performance against the rest of the industry. Both Tier 1 and Tier 2 will have access to a report that will provide general trends and anonymised findings related to the platform and case studies of companies interested in being a part of the Electrode community. The objectives of Electrode is to provide a continuously updated platform for cable failure. This can include metric outputs and listings such as, but not limited to, failure mode and root cause trends, mean times, failure rates of the various components from switchgear to switchgear, and most commonly used condition monitoring systems and how they are used. We'd be interested in recording the dates of when the owner operator is notified of defect, and the date of repair start, and the date of completion so that we can have an up-to-date and regular flow of metrics related to the mean time to recovery, mean time to repair, mean time between failures across the industry, as well as per individual site. We would not just be interested in metrics, but also lists related to common procedures, already mentioned monitoring technologies, but as well off testing and integrity management. We now have created our Cable Reliability and Failure Trending Working Group, who have been involved in our industry approved process. This process has utilised the knowledge and expertise of the industry who are keen to shape and mould the methodologies used and to support the move towards 
a recognised, regular, up-to-date offshore wind cable reliability metrics and failure trending. They can be used as evidence to support not only offshore wind cable advancements, but to help make existing cable systems more reliable and to lower costs associated with cable downtime, cable insurance claims and cable repair. The recorded data will include components from switchgear to switchgear. We'll request not only the component that failed, but the number of components on the entire farm. This will be used towards certain metrics. Once we have this information, we want to understand more about the affected components. So we will request the quantity of failed components and how many were repaired or replaced. We've had some great input from operator associates who are keen to support electrode. From these discussions, we have found that a key interest area is to understand where in the cable system, as well as where along the collector grid the failure is likely to occur and the impact this can have for the entire system. And to use this information towards preparing and being proactively aware of where the most failures are likely to occur along the string. We're also looking to collect the information available around failure modes. We've taken the description from the International Electrotechnical List that states that a failure mode is the manner in which a failure occurs. This includes, but is not limited to the examples provided here and in the report we have produced, um, which is available on our website. We've also taken the description from the International Electrotechnical List that states that failure mechanisms are the process that ultimately leads to failure. The examples shown for both modes and mechanisms have been selected from a variety of information from our own internal experience at Ori Catapult, reports and industry insight. With root causes, there is a level of uncertainty due to different factors. This could be due to underlying factors that may not necessarily be understood or shared. It may be because the qualifiers for root causes can have commercial and legal consequences and can take years after the incident to be determined. The root cause may be assumed rather than confirmed through diagnostics. And even from certain cases where diagnostics have taken place, it is still possible that maybe an underlying factor may not necessarily be identified due to the evidence being destroyed by catastrophic break and failure, leaving not much evidence behind. One solution to uncertainty around the root causes was to look into the possibility of identifying if the root cause selected in the platform is assumed or diagnosed. But this would only provide part of that picture. Another solution is to provide a percentage of certainty a confidence level, depending on the reliability of that cause being the primary root cause. Electrode metrics will be split into three categories. Repair metrics, KPI relating to the repair process. Production metrics, KPIs relating to downtime and lost production. Event metrics, failure rates and number of events. So tier one users will be able to view these metrics and their benchmarks on a quarterly, year to date or annual basis on the site and tier two users will be uh, only able to view the annual data that we published in the annual report. When users are logging information about their event, they will provide some key times and dates for the following milestones in the repair timeline. When the event occurs, when they are notified of the event, when logistics starts, and when the repair started and when operation is resumed. These times allow the Electro platform to calculate some of the repair metrics such as mean time to notification, mean time to diagnose, mean logistics time, mean time to repair or replace. Uh, we will also be able to calculate mean time to failure. Users will also be able to provide information on the cost of repair, number of technician hours needed to repair, and if there were any non-access days due to poor weather. Understanding failure rates of a system and its components come with many benefits. You can understand the reliability of a system or specific components. Improve the accuracy of your cost model. How much is the wind farm going to cost to run over its lifetime? Use failure rates to determine your maintenance strategy. Parts that fail often may need more maintenance, while maintenance in other parts could reduce in frequency. Tracking failure rates over time could help infer whether improvements have been made in manufacturing. And having accurate depiction of component system failure rates could support future reduction in insurance premiums. In its simplest form, failure is calculated dividing the number of failures by the total time in service. However, there are more advanced methods that allow for a more accurate treatment of a more complex sample. The more data that is inputted into the electro platform allows us to determine which approach we should take. Just like in Sparta, a system we have an operation already that benchmarks wind farm SCADA data and alarm mappings, downtime and lost production will be calculated in a similar way. Electrode will also be able to break down the production metrics by severity. So we look at critical, degraded, minor, incipient, as well as maintenance. 
These production metrics allow users to understand the financial and energy loss to their system in the event of faults, failures, and maintenance. We will also be using the same methods for anonymity, such as the rule of three for benchmark to ensure no identity is leaked. There are a multitude of benefits to the proposal of sharing better representation of data across the offshore wind sector. We've homed in on the benefits to offshore wind developers and operators with the support of our uh, operator associates. For developers, insight into common cable system related issues from mechanisms, modes, and potential root causes informing improved de uh, design and installation decisions to de risk operations. Justification for potential increased CAPEX for increased testing and monitoring systems improving availability in the operational phase of the wind farm and informing and directing developer innovation programs from direct industry evidence, enabling collaboration across the sector to provide solutions to real problems and de-risk future technologies. For operators, identify cable failure trends, supporting and de-risking any potential loss of availability and revenue, improving strategic owner and planning and decision-making to maximize generation. Inform internal targets through external benchmarking services, similar to our Sparta system. Provide a wider pool of evidence enabling rapid understanding of failure modes and potential solutions. Demonstration that the organization is a prudent operator and meets company values. And finally, provide evidence to insurers, ensuring that the insurance can be gained at the lowest practical cost, improving the OPEX margins. The development of Electrode has included lessons learned and starts. The tier two demographic is made up of those in the cable sector, such as supply chain, repair, installation services, insurance, innovation, and academia. Before subscription has been put in place, the tier two demographic have supported the development of the platform and have been involved in the approach taken for trending. They have brought their own expertise and knowledge to the craft, the cable reliability and failure trending working group, and have been invaluable to our project. The Craft Working Group have worked with us to provide their content in an interim report, as well as reviewing the report in the industry peer review process. Representing Tier 1, which is the demographic of owner operators, we've had operator associates review the report as well. In addition to this, we've also had one-to-one -one engagement where we've had further feedback and questions, which have impacted the way in which we are looking to develop the platform, which has also seen an extension of time added to our original scope. So this is our long-term goal for Electrode. We're currently looking for expressions of interest and we'll be looking for the system to be available in the coming year. There are a lot of great benefits out of the project, including potential future work and collaboration, creating major benefits for developers, operators, O&M services, as well as the supply chain. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to speaking to some of you offline as well as a, our QA session. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you. And next up, we're, we're joined by Professor Simon Rowland of the University of Manchester's Department of, Ele of Electric and Electronic Engineering to discuss the innovation challenges in his field of expertise. Professor Rowland has led projects in electrical materials at the university since 2003 after working in commercial cable development. Great. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, Dan, and thanks to uh, the Catapult for inviting me to, to give this presentation. I'm going to give a perspective on DC cable installation, um, but actually I think this applies to cable networks more generally. So I'm going to talk about the relationship between the plant um, that we've been talking about extensively in this session and the system. And in particular, I'm going to end up talking about issues around power quality and load and what they mean for asset management. So in terms of cable systems, um, as Alex said, we kind of got a very mature technology in terms of the plan, design, make, install, maintain and dispose for AC systems on land. And as we move towards um, submarine networks and indeed DC systems and DC networks, we're obviously making a transition from existing technologies. And that means we want to understand issues around what's not known, threats and identifying those, 
and identifying the opportunities. And I think it's really important to put that in the context, particularly for this session, about the innovation challenges are real opportunities when we identify these uncertainties. So there are two aspects. Firstly, the design of the product, the design of the system. And then secondly, the asset management, which we may think comes after the design, but in fact, those two things, it's a little bit like the chicken and egg. We need to think about them at the same time. We need to design for better asset management and we need to design our asset management around the system. So we developed a framework um, 15 years ago in the beginning, the early days of Supergen for thinking about asset management. <clears throat> This is a published um, model, and in it there are five key layers for the asset manager. The top layer, asset management, is around the decisions of the asset manager. Those, do we do maintenance? Do we replace? Do we repair? Do we do nothing? The next layer is understanding material and equipment status then we need to worry about stress factors. And that's what is the environment in which the product is working. And that, for example, includes moving from AC to DC. That's a very different stress. And we talked about floating platforms, which are subject to mechanical stresses, which may be a new thing. And once we know those stresses, we can think about the aging mechanisms and what we might not have thought about before with previous stress factors. And finally, we look at measure ends. And uh, that's particularly to help the, the asset manager and say, what is it that we can measure that enables us to manage the system better? We can extend this to seven layers, which is perhaps appropriate in the current uh, climate. And that's to look at network management because asset management must sit within the broader scheme of network management and the need to manage customers and stakeholders' expectations. There's always a danger that technical people, like me, want to spend more and more money to make a system more and more reliable, where of course that's not necessarily the optimum solution. So by looking at these as separate layers, by maybe brainstorming with people from different areas, we can identify what we don't know. And often for technical people, that's kind of the hardest thing to admit. We tend to take what we do know and package it up and sell it on. But actually the really big issues should be around what we don't know, the underlying threats, and then what we can do about them. So we might start, as I've said, by thinking about stress factors, um, the move to DC, the move to oscillations in offshore platforms and so on, what the aging mechanisms may be, um, Alex and Will have talked about electrical treeing, for example, water treeing, mechanical strains and so on. And then what does that do to our equipment and to our material, given the design of our equipment? And then as a last stage, what can we measure? And it's in DC, measuring partial discharge is much harder than AC. As the networks get more complicated, as the cable runs get longer, measuring partial discharge becomes much harder. So we need to understand that and develop that better. And then finally, we can integrate that into an asset management program. So to give specific examples, electrical tree growth, these are these microscopic hollow defects which develop in polymeric insulation in cables, in joints, in terminations, in time. They grow over many years. And we understand pretty much how these develop in AC networks. And we have expertise now in measuring those. In DC, those trees grow much more slowly. They require much higher voltages. And so we may think, well, maybe then DC is a benign environment. 
However, the DC cable doesn't actually see a steady state fixed voltage. That's a bit of a misnomer. There's a power quality issue. So if the DC has an AC ripple, or if there are small a voltage level switching, which mounts to a square wave, this becomes a very different environment. And we need to understand whether that is more deleterious or maybe more benign than the AC environment. And we actually don't know that at all at the moment. So that's one thing we're working on. Similarly, that means we need to understand what the power quality really is in a DC network. And I don't think we do. It's actually quite difficult to find out the power quality in AC networks. So there's a major question um, for our community. And if under DC, power, uh, partial discharges are fewer and the cables are longer and they're harder to measure, how do we monitor that system? So there is a, um, uh, a large project called DC Networks Power Quality and Plant Reliability funded by EPSRC. Um, that's a collaboration between the University of Manchester, Imperial College, and the University of Strathclyde. And we're addressing those three questions within that project. We're really keen to have collaborators um, in that uh, activity. So if anyone's interested in finding out what's going on, um, particularly if you can bring knowledge about network um, power quality, we'd be really pleased to hear from you. So another issue um, about the transition from AC to DC revolves around the design and the performance of polymeric insulation, and in particular, electrical field control. So this is some work I've taken from colleagues in China. This is a classic joint cross section. Um, I'll just describe what we've got. We've got um, a cable conductor, we've got an original cable insulation layer, item three. And this is um, joined to another cable over here. This is a cross section clearly. And we stripped off the insulation and replaced that with some stress control materials. And on top of that, we put a new insulation layer, probably molded. And we've also got a stress cone here to manage the stress along this internal insulation surface. Now, this is very traditional technology in an AC cable. We can use our knowledge to model very carefully the stresses along that surface. Now in AC, these stresses are controlled by the capacitance of the system. In other words, the permittivity, which happens to be fairly constant in temperature. However, if we do the same thing in a DC cable, these stresses are controlled by the uh, insulation resistivity. And the, the resistivity of a material is very temperature dependent. I've got here a plot of the, the um, conductivity of an insulation material as a function of temperature in Kelvin here. And you can see it changes by two orders of magnitude in the working range. This is a huge change in properties. And what that means is if we look at a cross section of a cable, um, here we have a uniform temperature, the inside of the cable, the conductor is the same temperature as the outside. And in that situation, we have the field is slightly higher in the center than the outside because of the geometry of the cable. But if we move to the situation where the inside is now elevated in temperature, this means that the resistivity of the material in the inside is very much lower than the resistivity outside. And so the voltage dropped on the inside is very much less. So if we increase the temperature here in our cable, let's see if I can stop that at a sensible place, we can see that the field in the center of the cable is very much reduced. And the field is now maximum on the outside, quite the opposite of what we had previously and the opposite of what we have in the AC situation. If I show you the graph here of the field inside the cable, 
This end um, is the, the conductor surface, and this end is the outside of the cable. And you can see this blue line indicates the field when the temperature on the inside is the same as the outside. And you can see, as we saw earlier, the field is greatest on the inside and least on the outside. If we allow a 70 degree difference between the inside and the outside, <clears throat> the field on the inside is massively reduced, but the field on the outside is now over twice what that original field was. So the lesson here is that in the DC situation, we have to design for a variety of temperatures, both static, as in the drawing in the diagram here, but also dynamic, because clearly the temperature in the core will change with time. So this image is no longer as simple as it once was. And if we change temperature, then we'll see very different field gradients in this system. If there are defects in the system, and of course the design allows for that, we also have to allow for those defects to see this change in temperature. So we have a much more complicated situation than we did previously. Incidentally, if we add mechanical strain to this, that extra variable gives us a further um, difficulty and that we're trying to learn how to model those things now. So going back to our seven layer model, we've seen that the stress factors are now changing. We have time dependent loads. This will lead to changes in the conductivity or the resistivity, for example, in materials, which changes our fields. And perhaps in DC, we need to reinvent how we even monitor the cable in time. So in summary then, the challenge is really to optimize the system design and understand the system design as well as uh, the system performance through a deeper knowledge of plant capability and system requirements. And at the moment, I feel we don't really understand the system well enough to understand how the plant is going to behave in the context of its working environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. That was great. Cheers. And we've been having some really good questions coming in over, over the previous presenters. Um, the original plan was to put a question out to, to each of you, but I think what we'll do is we'll go through the questions and, and see who's best place to answer them. Um, we probably won't have time to cover everything. We've only got 10 minutes, but please do post your questions on the Ori Catapults um, LinkedIn thread after this event. We'll try to get back to you and answer it as many as we can. Um, one of the ones which unfortunately marked as answered, but I don't think it was. If it was, I, I momentarily missed it. And um, it was a good one from a good question from Terry, who said, um, maybe touch productively with DNV about to release the next revision of F109, which dubiously claims to be relevant to cables and umbilicals. To what extent is the subsidy cable industry needing bespoke design recommendation practices to be developed, avoiding inheriting the over conservative and overly expensive oil and gas methods. Now, who would like to, to pick up this, this mantle? Is that is that a Will type question? Yeah, I can give Will a bit more time to think, Alex, here. Um, sure, go for it. I'm not going to answer the question, but I'll just say that typically standards follow technology. Technology does not lead standards. Uh, sorry, technology and experience lead standards. <laughs> Um, so they do not, you know, we need to get a dominant design before things can be standardized. And as such, um, you know, standards do take a decade to germinate, um, can take it. It's, it. You know, there are organizations like C. Gray out there, like DNV, that put out the recommendations earlier than the, 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 the formal standards regime um, will respond. Um, but I think that's the, natu the natural progress that... Um, comes with experience. Uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm no expert on this, but um, there's obviously been some quite high profile issues with, with F109 type problems of on bottom stability and, and cable protection. Um, the Carbon Trust is, is launching, a, I guess, a desktop project this year, looking into this problem. 
Um, I think there's going to be some industry demand for wind focused testing, wind focused analysis of this problem, because um, I guess it's it's a very specific problem to some issues with, with wind that's, and some of the oil and gas standards are a bit more general, but there's certainly a, a balance of uh, cost and reliability to be had there. And I don't think we're there yet. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, if I ask go to, to the next one, another interesting one um, from anonymous attendee who asks or states to start with the ability to disconnect dynamic cables and mirroring from floating uh, WTGs and reconnect again is important as many ON interventions needed from turbines are not possible without towing the units to calmer waters or Keyside. What needs to be done to ensure the integrity of a dynamic cable system to avoid having to install a replacement cable and reuse the cable initially installed. So what, what are the, the key things that need to be developed or, or worked on design practice to be able to enable that? Or if if it's not uh, jumping to us straight away, we can we can move that to the LinkedIn page. That's always a good get out clause if you want me to say that. I think we might need to part that down, but it, it will, I understand it will be a, a subject that the Floating Wind Centre of Excellence will be looking at. Because uh, obviously it's a key issue on, on how you make that disconnect and how you safely lower the cable. Um, I think there's a there's no strong consensus, is my understanding, on whether that disconnect will be topside or even subsea. Um, so it's I think it's one that needs to be worked on, and there's no strong solution at the moment that I'm aware of. Okay. So. It raises something if I might comment on. Um... In the electro project, and that is the need to record the working environment of the, of the asset. And quite often when we look at trying to learn the lessons from um, failures or even just reclaiming um, product that hasn't failed, the weaknesses are that we really don't know the working history of the product. So if we could encourage people to record that from the beginning, that would be really helpful, I think. Yeah, which really does play back into, into what Charlotte was talking about on, on with the electro program. How do you improve what you're not monitoring? Um, it, it's, it's remarkably hard. Um, and there's, there's a question along the electrode lines as well. Um, I know there's been a lot of work done with the supply chain in the tier two, uh, as, as Charlotte was calling it, a workshop. Um, so two questions. One is, could you give us a potential example of a spin-off electrode project or program? Um, and can the tier two access by or, or how do they access the, the failure data in the future? Yeah, so I'll answer your second one first. So we'll be hoping to release an annual report that will provide uh, the most comprehensive trends uh, produced from the platform. We will be looking to release that through a subscription. Uh, if you're interested in that and you are part of the tier two demographic, please do get in touch and we can discuss that offline. Um, with regards to the benefits to tier two, I realized during the presentation, I touched mainly on developer and operator benefits, but there are many benefits to the entire, um, the entire sector. One of these could be spin-off opportunities, uh, for example, deep dives into recurring modes and mechanisms, or looking at condition monitoring systems and how to optimize these systems, or even troubleshooting uh, life cycle aspects, as Alex had touched on, and installation and manufacturing challenges, and also improving current integrity management routines as well. So there's many different ways that we could do this. And another way is to work with the tier two demographic to um, share their stories, their case studies throughout the report as well. So we are still at very early stages of electrodes and the tier two uh, community is already growing. And if you are interested, please, please do get in touch. Cheers. Uh, and uh, another one, maybe a, a slightly more basic business development style question. Um, what is the, the typical design life or expectancy for a dynamic uh, offshore wind farm cable? Uh, and does the owner operator identify a half life or replacement schedule based around the numbers of life years ex, you know, expected on that structure? Um, it says typically an umbilical would not have 25 to 30 years design life which is uh, regularly specified for a static OF, oh, offshore wind farm cable. 
So what, what's the what's the half life? What's the design life for dynamic cable? I think there's a reason why no one's answered that. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> so I think we have I'm a just... problem with uh, the way that we're doing this. All the easy questions have gone into the answer <laughs> box. Um, so we've left ourselves the hard ones. I think, Danny, um, if I can never go not answering yeah. that, um, I think, you know, the, the recommendations out there for qualification, you know, and the fatigue life qualification is to assess um, the stresses and strains and forces that the cable will experience over its lifetime and try and replicate that on a test bench. So that's the way it's written. And I think that's a lot of work is underway trying to assess exactly that and um, the performance of these cables, you know, fatigue testing of dynamic cables, as opposed to umbilicals is a relatively new space. Um, so the next few years, we'll learn a lot. Um, I, if we were to bring it right, right back to root causes, um, what role does the cable configuration itself play in either optimization or, or failure? So the, uh, the configuration of the cable layout itself, what, what role does that play in, in terms of root, root causes? I presume the, the question is about the configure, the makeup, the constituent elements within the cable. Is that, I'll, I'll, I'm assuming that anyway, so the answer is based on that. I think the more complex the cable system, the more opportunities for failure there are. Um, so if you do have lots of external layers, metallic layers that are there to do one thing, for example, block water from entering the cable, those by their very metallic nature um, will transmit and carry current that is induced from the magnetic fields that um, prevail in that area. So um, that is, you know, that's one aspect, the more the more complexity, the more layers that are built into a cable system, the more opportunity for, for things to go wrong. I, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but the simpler, the better. I think there's another aspect around in a network, the, the power quality will vary through the network, the load will vary through the network. So understanding that is an important feature. Indeed. I think also well, there, there, is, there is work going on about alternative um, materials and technologies to make the cable system more resilient. Um, I talked earlier about metallic water blocking layers. Um, we, we're working um, with, with another company in, in the UK um, who is developing a um, self-repairing water blocking layer, which you know could be applicable to dynamic applications going forward. So that would um, you know, benefit the overall cable by, by having a flexible, you know, self-healing um, water blocking layer as opposed to um, a metallic, um, let's not call it brittle, but um, a metallic layer that wouldn't fatigue very well under dynamic conditions. Great, maybe maybe time for one more, um, a topical one. So Orsted recently announced that about 10 of their operating offshore wind uh, cable protection systems, CPS, are damaged and need to be replaced. Uh, resulting in a total of about 400 million euros cost. I'm reading this direct from uh, from the question for uh, for, ac for accuracy's sake. What is your view on this news and and overall views and thoughts on CPS on as a whole? Who who would like to take this one? Maybe we could put that onto. I, on I guess. Link. <laughs> okay. I, guess it, it, I think I, my understanding was it was linked to the previous question on DNVF um, 109 in it, the standards for the standards for testing and design of these systems. And uh, I guess I'll say the same again, that we're not quite there yet on the, the balance of risk and cost and the understanding of these systems. Um, that there is going to be ongoing work in this area, but I think the key part is, is testing getting some realistic tests for how these systems behave um, and using that to sort of define a better design. Um, because clearly there, it's in the design where all this is, this is happening. Yeah, and I think if I can jump in there, you know, as I mentioned in my slides, I think um, we are only halfway through the, you know, the, the expected operating lifetime of some of the oldest wind farms now. Um, so these 
our lessons that will be learned. Um, will mentions design, um, but it's a new application um, for technology and we are learning lessons. So as far as commentary, um, those systems, I don't know the details specifically around those systems, but I presume they might not, in, in hindsight, they might not be fit for pers purpose. And I assume designs will be iterated and improved based on service experience. But hindsight is a wonderful thing, yes. It is, it is. Um, and that's, that's all we have time for, guys, um, unfortunately. Um, that's all the time for, for this section of the webinar. You can find out more information on, on Electro, the work underway at our research hubs, including the University of Manchester's work, uh, all the work being done at the High Voltage Lab at ore.catapult.org.uk. Um, thanks for everyone speaking today and answering those tricky questions. Um, it's it's never easy to, to come on camera on recording uh, and answer questions that you don't know about ahead of time. So thank you to everybody. Um, moving on, um, we're now going to talk about insurance, specifically the feasibility of mutual insurance in the offshore renewable sector. Um, we, we just heard about the background. Uh, we, we've heard about failures. We've heard about failure rates. Um, let's hear about the impacts of some of that uh, and the impact specifically on insurance. Um, for this, we've invited Michael Bullock from Renewable Risk. He's a um, Renewable Risk is a, a specialist risk management consultancy and insurance broker that specializes in renewable energy. So over to you, Michael. Uh, Dan, thank you very much indeed. And um, a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, just a, a quick intro. Um, this presentation is effectively a joint venture with our partners at Prospect Law, who is a, a, a specialist legal firm with considerable expertise, both in um, the energy sector and in insurance structures. Um, so moving on, uh, we will run through um, a brief discussion of who we are, Renewable Risk, and what we do. Um, Cables 101 will not be uh, seeking to um, upstage the four masterclasses you already had in terms of the risks to cables so much as discussing how those um, risks and the consequences of them interact with insurance policies uh, with a couple of case studies. And then uh, a recap for those um, that uh, may be bemused by the workings of the insurance sector as to quite how, how that all fits together, uh, what the impact is on this sector and why um, we're recommending a mutual approach for some of the participants. So who we are, uh, we, I'm, I'm flying solo, Joe, my colleague there, um, as we've been on air, he's sent me a text saying he's now a father of his second child. So he has a decent excuse for not being here, I think. Um, Joe, uh, as well as having significant experience in offshore development himself um, with various hats in the past, latterly spent four years working for uh, a a firm called Lloyd Warwick, which is uh, one of the main lead loss adjusters in the offshore energy space. So much of his time was spent dealing with um, working through the actual uh, claims process um, on offshore cables. A loss adjuster, just quickly, is basically um, uh, an intermediary trying to see that uh, a claim is settled fairly to all parties and in line with the policy wording. So, um, so they have to go into very fine detail on both the scope of cover and the amounts uh, involved. My background, um, more on the um, uh, insurance and risk advisory side of things, but I did have, <coughs> excuse me, I did have a brief foray working with a, a an offshore engineering consultancy that some of you will know called CROC, um, which is now uh, related to natural power consultants, past, part of Fred Olson. So uh, although mostly on the uh, risk advisory stage, um, I have, along with some of our other colleagues, some, some insight from the other side of the fence. Um, within that, we as a firm look, as the name suggests, across the renewable sector, um, 
it's a, it's a fairly broad sector with a variety of risks, but I would say that probably more than half of our time is spent on offshore work. So uh, cables become an increasingly frequent discussion wherever we turn. Um, within that, we, uh, we do talk clients through their project, um, the risk identification stage, the risk analysis and, and presentation to potential insurers. We can act as a broker. We are increasingly tending not to, to leave that to others to do the transactional side of things. And Joe has joined us to create more of a post-loss advisory side of things. So when there has been a claim, whether or not somebody is already a client, to hold their hands through the process, which, um, as we'll see, can be fairly detailed and time consuming. OK, so Cables 101, you've seen these stats on previous slides. But a key takeaway, to me at least, is that if you work through particularly that 57 out of the last 60 construction projects having experienced cable claims, that means that only this is in uh, Western Europe, I believe, is that stat. That means that only about 5% of projects have not experienced a cable claim, um, which is a fairly staggering statistic if you think about it. And from the perspective of why the insurance sector is struggling to um, deal with this to the participants' satisfaction, uh, that's a key metric. You know, it, it becomes almost predictable that almost every project is going to have a cable claim of some sort, um, which explains some of the uh, issues we're we're about to discuss. Um, forgive me, some of these were to be delivered by Joe with his specialist expertise, so bear with me, I will do my best. Uh, my key takeaway from this slide, which is an example of a specific incident, is uh, what one would hope might in some senses be one of the less risky operations being a winching to shore uh, from a, therefore a stable base. You can still have um, problems snagging, et cetera, in the duct. Uh, but in particular, this, this claim, which turned out in the end to be 10 million pounds, that was after two and a half years, um, it was actually settled and that was double the original estimate. So the whole process of making a claim on your insurance policy from start to finish requires going through all that root cause investigation. It requires uh, detailed analysis of the scope of cover, uh, apportionment of blame in many instances. You can, um, you can see some offshore claims being so complex that there is even potentially the op opportunity for a discussion as to whether more than one deductible should apply. And when we're talking offshore deductibles, we're, we're talking in the millions. So uh, if there are seen to be two separate incidents and two deductibles apply, that drastically reduces the net amount of any claim in incidents like this. Um, the, is it damaged? Um, I, I would actually add, is it damage which is insured as well as the question of this, if it's damaged? So just to note, uh, for those of you that, as with your own household contents insurance, there are some standard in insurance exclusions for things like corrosion and wear and tear and so on and so forth, that if that is seen as the root cause of the damage, um, it may be damaged, but it's not insured. Uh, the, the question uh, also being driven at in this slide is what constitutes damage from the perspective of an insurance policy. So um, forgive the painful insurance acronym, the LEG stands for London Engineering Group. Uh, this is the um, scope of cover that ideally clients aspire to uh, and in, in, in cables and it, it effectively, when it comes, it's to do with defects essentially and uh, defects are, um, varying degrees of exclusions applied. This is the ideal which doesn't cover any scope for improvement or betterment in a claim. But the trigger, as far as that definition is concerned, um, refers to any patent detrimental change in the physical condition of the insured property. What does that mean in practice? So um, essentially, 
uh, we are we're looking at, at the case where, um, for instance, uh, if the outer serving of a cable has been worn away, eroded, uh, scour damage, etc., through seabed movement, the cable hasn't necessarily ceased to function. Um, there is a there's a, there's an area of uncertainty there as to whether actually you've got a claim yet. Um, similarly, if if you've spotted a uh, a potential fault, if your cable monitoring systems are showing showing a, a future fault that is not yet constituting damage or or inability of the cable to operate, there's a big grey area. You haven't yet necessarily got a trigger for the ordinary insurance policy to kick in and say, right, okay, you've got a claim, we'll we'll pay for it, which which can have some very unfortunate consequences um, in the sense that um, it may mean that for those incidents you have to wait until there is formally definite damage before you can trigger your insurance policy. Uh, you even potentially lead to a question mark over whether you whether you have to declare the fact that uh, that outer servings worn away and it's possibly less protected should there be some other external cause. So that that might mean that you have special conditions imposed by insurers that renewal related to that. So so these these issues of difficult definitions as to whether something constitute damage can have very real long-term ramifications as to whether you can claim on an insurance policy per se. Um, I would also say that actually some damage being difficult to detect, at least at the time, um, even if it then does turn into damage uh, in a more uh, easy to respond form for the insurance sector, still requires all that root cause analysis. So uh, one of one of Joe's claims he was involved in involved some fiber optic cable, which turned out after the root cause analysis to have been crushed during the installation process. Now, the implication of that is twofold. On the one hand, um, depending on quite when it's discovered, uh, the, it points back to the damage having been uh, in the construction phase. So, um, subject to the notification clauses, it should be referred to the construction policy, but more particularly also uh, the when you've got those big deductibles referred to, um, the, there's a question of allocation of responsibility and whether that falls to contractors or, um, or the principal insured. Um, so uh, the insurance 101 side of things, how does the insurance industry actually um, work uh, at high level and forgive me for those that uh, this is recapping painful detail but um, you you identify or the client identifies a a risk that they need to be insured we're talking cables here primarily obviously uh, he normally talks to a broker who goes takes the presentation having discussed it and discuss the risks and scope of cover and uh, limitation required takes it to an insurer um, with a full information package. There's an iterative process of negotiation after which uh, once agreement is reached, um, a policy is issued in exchange for a premium. Um, the, there is just as important as the policy stating in painful detail what is insurance insured is uh, that it covers what's not insured and we've already mentioned wear and tear and the like as being a typical exclusion um, it's important for probably uh, with help from the broker a discussion around where the residual risk lies how much of a deductible you're taking as well as what's excluded um, and how to manage those risks going forward that you as the insured are left with um, in terms of uh, when the uh, insurance premium is charged um, for all sorts of normally perfectly decent reasons, there are a number of attritional costs added on to the actual claim costs, including insurer profit, fees for the broker, expenses to manage the claim and so on and so forth. The, the problem when you get to... Um, 95% of projects having claims 
is that that uh, uh, that level of claims almost becomes um, predictable if you have a big enough pool of similar insured insured parties, um, and you can actually find more efficient ways of doing that than the the various parties involved in the settlement. I mean, efficient both in terms of the overall cost and potentially the process and duration that two and a half years we discussed. Um, so the, there are a number of parties who, again, for good reasons, including loss adjusters, I mentioned Joe used to be one, loss assessors are the other side of that coin for, um, for the acting on behalf of the insured specifically. Forensic analysis, you need the root cause analysis in order to understand what happened and whether policy is covered. And lawyers are frequently engaged depending on whether there's any uh, discussions about blame in particular. Uh, and obviously the insurers and brokers come into it with their uh, expertise. So it's, it's, it's a complex process. As I say, they're complex claims. So um, that is par for the course, but with with sufficient um, uh, sufficient parties brought to together, there may be ways of streamlining that, which we'll address in a moment. This problem is getting particularly um, an issue now. Uh, we are in uh, what is called a hard market in insurance terms, which means premiums have been rising, deductibles have been rising, and the scope of cover has been reducing. Um, so where, where we referred to those claims previously on those tables, we're seeing much bigger deductibles, but we're also seeing where, where I, I made that painful reference to leg three before, we're seeing increasingly that's difficult to obtain for off-toe operators in particular, um, I think across the space generally. And instead, instead if, you, if you suffer from having to look through such documentation, you might become involved in discussions around leg two instead of leg three. But the important difference is leg two um, covers the consequences of defects, not the costs of um, repairing them in the first place. So essentially, it excludes the amount that it would have cost to repair that cable had the defect been known before there was actual damage, which essentially uh, it will exclude typically the marine operations costs or at least a significant chunk of them, which if you hark back to some of the earlier slides, constitute something like 66% of all those offshore cable claims. So, so the, the reduction in cover and the um, increase in deductibles means that there is much more limited actual insurance currently available for many of the market participants for their cables. Is that hard market going to turn? Uh, it's looking unlikely for a, a few years, to be honest. Um, there are some new players coming in. Uh, I think they're, uh, they're particularly attracted by catastrophe rates in highly exposed areas rather than necessarily offshore cables at the moment. We are seeing some, some insurers moving into the offshore wind sector from uh, ceasing to, to write offshore oil and gas, but I don't think that's at such a stage where uh, where the market conditions are likely to turn for the immediate future. So um, OIL is an acronym, uh, as well as being OIL, it's an acronym for the Offshore, offshore Insurance Limited, I think. Uh, but it basically, it's an oil and gas sector mutual, which was established some 30 or so years ago, when in particular, at that instance, it was uh, following uh, windstorms in the Caribbean rates rose so much so quickly that the oil and gas majors got together to do it themselves um, or do at least the parts that the insurance sector was signaling to them that they didn't want to cover themselves and to um, take away the exposure to uh, to the hard market that was in place at the time um, and offer broader cover. So, so this sort of mutual um, approach, it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be to entirely replace 
traditional insurance, in my opinion, it should be to work alongside it in a partnership basis. But where we're seeing those signals that cables are extremely difficult to offer the level of cover they're currently at, at least in a commercially uh, effective manner, um, you can mutualize uh, your risks together. It gives you more control over the long term pricing because you can get closer to the actual cost of risk. Uh, some of those attritional costs don't apply to a mutual. Um, you, can, you can actually um, pull your knowledge and share resources, uh, potentially even um, subject to specification. You can share spares, possibly you could share um, call off agreements with uh installation vessels to reduce the costs if you have increased certainty over uh, a bigger pool it's, there's going to be almost constant demand for them you can manage that better you can providing choice on how to protect the business and discretion with claims mutuals allow you to set what cover you want to give it allows you to set the triggers so if if we're talking referring back to uh, those outer servings being damaged or seabed movement needing addressing in order to protect against potential future actual insurance claims, or if we're talking about um, the detection of faults that haven't yet constituted damage, a mutual would be allowed to, but, uh, subject to its own rules and the agreement of its members, set those as trigger points um, so it can respond to those which aren't necessarily claim events for the tip for the standard insurance policy um, and depending on how it's set up uh, it is not necessarily the case that um, for instance uh, if it's a discretionary mutual uh, any contributions to it do not um, do not get subject to the addition of 12 percent insurance premium tax also, so it again adds to the potential um, economic efficiency of the story. Um, to that end, um, and specifically at this stage, looking at offtos, um, we are we're recommending and discussing with certain of the offtos the possibility of creating a, a feasibility study between ourselves and Prospect Law to um, to address how we'd go about. Uh, establishing the benefits of that, establishing how it would work in relation to their, their obligations to uh, their counterparties, including Ofgem and the like, uh, and to um, make recommendations as to the best legal structure for that. Um, again, this is something of a recap. Why should, why should people mutualize? We do have a lack of insurance availability for cables at the moment. Uh, the mutual can address that and address it in a cost effective manner um, with the members being uh, not only having greater vis visibility of how um, the contributions to the mutual pool are costed for each one, but also it takes out the market cycle significantly subject to uh, the elements that are still perhaps reinsured in the commercial market if if that is the case but as I say I think uh, some sort of participate partnership with the uh, conventional insurers would still almost certainly make sense to that end um, and the risk management benefits uh, are substantial um, you can you can really create the mechanisms to reduce reduce the actual cost of those risks by preemptive maintenance, by sharing resources and so on. So what is it? It's, a, it's essentially a club. Uh, it's pulled together where, where all this self-insurance is happening by default through the size of deductibles and increasing um, exclusions on the policy cover. It's a club that can manage those on behalf of the group of its members. The uh, any excess, any profits can be distributed back or or retained for uh, future future losses, loss reserves, and so on and so forth. And it's significantly for the elements that it retains. It's significantly independent of the vagaries of the insurance market. So uh, I've whistled through that. I hope uh, in about the right sort of time. Um, 
that's essentially what we've addressed is uh, the difficulties with claims for insurance on cables. Um, the reasons probably for the uh, for that in terms of the way the insurance market is structured and therefore why a mutual could well be um, a solution to those parts that the insurance sector is struggling to address at the moment. Um, Dan, I think that's that's my presentation that's done. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we'll do four minutes, four minutes of questions. Um, I'll, I'll try my best to try and keep up and, and sum up as, uh, as I saw it. Um, really interesting on, on the hardening market and relatively bleak about that market turning. Um, things are going to stay stay hard. Um, and, you know, in, in my mind, insurance works when the many are willing to pay for the few. And I can absolutely understand why things are becoming more expensive when 57 out of 60 of the recent projects experience claims that, that stops working. Um, so explain to me again, why transferring the risk from traditional insurance to mutual? Why is, why is that beneficial? And, and tell me again about the relationship with risk management. What's the benefit to an off or to a generator in terms of risk management if they were to be involved in this kind of a club? Um, so um, the, the risk management benefits, well, the, it is, um, it's certainly the case that there is uh, considerable expertise within the off-toes, within the sector as a whole, and within clearly the likes of Catapult as to best practice. A mutual um, has the discretion really to uh, adopt those best practices subject to agreement of its members. It can say, right, these are, uh, this, is, this is what you need to do in order to qualify for membership um, or, either in order to qualify for membership or in order to qualify for this level of premium as opposed to that, that level of premium. So it can, through its own knowledge or the knowledge of its members, it can really define those risk management standards based on experience. Um, again, where, uh, where we're already talking about a significant amount of their claims having to be retained by them currently, you can... Um, manage that better on an individual um, off-toe basis anyway, because uh, rather than um, any one off-toe being claims free for four years and then having a few million pounds in the fifth year, you do spread that risk amongst 19, 20 off-toes, uh, hopefully more in the future. So, um, so there's, a, there's a more regular hit of small contributions to that individual member rather than, rather than a one-off big blast. So it, it's, it's, it's a much better financial long-term cash flow management of those retained losses, essentially. Yeah, the, the risk management side definitely speaks back to what Charlotte was saying earlier and, and Simon as well, talking about how do you improve what or you're not monitoring, and this sounds like a good way of, of, of sharing sharing those practices or setting those standards internally. Um, why 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 off those specifically, um, or, or is that just where where you're looking to, to start with this feasibility study? Um, and what 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 would be a perfect re result for you today if someone was to get in touch? I mean, I think um, there is applicability in other parts of the sector, most certainly. Um, and as as has been described, there's no lack of issues with intra-array cables or or the unknowns that might come, come about with um, dynamic cables in future, which are unlikely particularly to be the off-toes bag, but there could be relevance to similar structures to assist there. But in particular, I think the off-toes currently um, represent uh, a group with similar issues and challenges and similar regulatory structure in the way, in the sense of how they um, interact with Ofgem and how Ofgem supports them um, or, or has to step in uh, if certain elements are uninsurable and so on and so forth. Um, but they also possibly face the worst of um, the hard market because uh, they own or the vast majority of their assets are these offshore cables, which are the ones causing difficulty, difficulty to insurers where 
um, where it's a relatively small proportion of the values, perhaps for the offshore wind farm itself. So, so I think the offtos have the most visible uh, and immediate need, but it's certainly transferable elsewhere beyond that. Should the um, should the appetite be there? Brilliant. Thanks for your thanks for your time today. Thank you, and uh, happy to answer any questions over the coming days as as appropriate. Absolutely. Uh, thank you to everyone who sub uh, submitted questions. If you have any more um, that you think about over the coming days or, or the rest of the day um, that you'd like to put to our partners at Renewable Risk, please do post on social media thread on LinkedIn using the link that's, that's hopefully in the chat box. Um, we're going to close today's event with discussion of a brand new project that brings together Ori Catapult and three UK technology innovators. We're talking to ProServe, Synaptic and BPP Cables aiming to be a game changer for cable failure prediction. The ECG project has just secured funding from Innovate UK to develop a novel monitoring and prediction system. So today we're joined by Paul, Paul Cook, who's a senior product manager at ProServe, a leading provider of innovative control systems. We have Tom Morley, who leads business development at Synaptic, a long-standing partner of Ori Catapult, and Darren Moore, a lead engineer at cable system solution provider, BPP Cables. Um, I wanted to say before we get into today's discussion, setting the scene a little bit, that the project is is obviously it's only just when it's funding, it's it's very much still in development. This is an R&D collaboration, it's a work in progress, um, and, and people should see it as, as such. Um, thanks. Let's let's we've got a slide in the background there. Um, we have we have we have um, the panelists joining us, and let's let's start nice nice and wide and broad. How did the collaboration between ProServe, Synaptic, and BPP Cables take shape and, and come together, guys? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, really pleased to be part of this web webinar. Um, just to give you a bit of an overview, uh, I guess, on, on how this came about, if we go back to 2018, um, there was an industry challenge call that was um, that, that, that went to the industry between Scottish Power Renewables and OERI Catapult um, on four specific challenges. And one of those challenges was um, cable monitoring and how uh, traditional cable monitoring systems were uh, could be perceived as um, inadequate or insufficient to to monitor uh, the cable systems that are being developed by the industry today. Um, and, and as a part of that, that challenge, there was four specific areas or pain points that, that, uh, that Scottish Power and, and the Catapult kind of put, put to the industry. And that was the fact that there was 80% of insurance claims are attributed to, to cable failures. Um, you know, ca cable failures can be in the region of, you know, tens of millions of, of pounds to um, to put right, whether that be um, uh, whether that be a repair or a replacement, and, and that's also excluding transmission losses. Um, cable repairs can can be expensive and time consuming, and and severely disrupt um, production, and also the fact that. Uh, or failures. So through that challenge, um, the, the, tech, uh, the technology um, uh, group within ProServe got together and looked at various kind of concepts and analysed what is available in the market today. Uh, and essentially that is where the ECG concept was born. Uh, and then we were uh, paired up uh, with, with uh, Synaptec essentially um, through, through the concept and, and through the catapult. And we also were knowledgeable of BPP cable solutions through an industry event that we attended in Blythe going back two or three years ago. And through those kind of introductions, there was, there was clear synergies um, between Synaptec and, and BPP cables, you know, Synaptec being a, a unique photonic instrumentation company for power system networks and cable assets. And then we have BPP cables, you know, an independent subsea cable specialist uh, and consultancy company with extensive uh, expertise and 30 year heritage in, in cable engineering. So there was a, there's an obvious synergy um, through that concept and, and the gaps that we could bridge uh, through that concept with strategic partners. Um, so through that, uh, we, we held an extensive two day workshop um, going back a couple of years ago uh, to, to further develop the, the, the ECG concept and brainstorm, you know, what is it that we really need to achieve and what is it that the industry need um, to start reducing uh, cable failures and, and the OPEX of, of cable systems. And also what are the clear differentiators uh, that we're going to offer to the market through the ECG system. 
Um, and then through that, we, we, we signed a, a, an MOU, a technology development MOU, um, a three-way MOU between the parties uh, as a part of the consortium. Uh, as you said uh, on the introduction, we've recently um, achieved Innovate UK um, smart grant funding uh, to further develop uh, ECG, uh, which is covering two thirds of the overall project cost. And right now we're um, in the development phase um, uh, where we're, we're developing the ECG software and the system as a part of our development schedule should be ready for demonstration by Q2 next year. Well, um, and please don't, don't be afraid to, to dumb it down if we need to, but what does the ECG project do? What does the product aim to do? And, and more importantly, how is it a differentiator? From what's currently out there at the moment compare in comparison to the, the state of the art yeah that's a really good question um i suppose in a couple of words it's fault prediction um but outside of that it you know ecg is much more than just a, a traditional monitoring system um you know in fact it goes uh, much more uh, further and beyond uh, than just a, a a traditional monitoring system it's almost a, a management system um, ECG is going to be developed uh, in line with, um, you know, fixed bottom and AC systems, but also floating DC systems. We, we very much need to, to keep that in mind because obviously that is the future of, of, uh, of offshore wind as, as uh, step outs and, and these fields become further offshore. And, um, and we need to ensure that we can not only uh, fit this to new, new systems or, or new fields, but also retrofits as well. Um, so ECG integrates already proven technologies um, and parameters and, and also unique technologies uh, from Synaptec into a holistic and integrated solution. So the proven technologies could be DTS, DAS, uh, partial discharge, distributed electromechanical sensing, as I, as I covered from, um, from Synaptec, and also um, any other metrics and, and parameters that will be uh, that will have an impact on the integrity of cable systems and also the way that cable systems are managed. So it's very much taking a holistic approach um, and it's not just integrating these parameters into one system, it's correlating the data and data access. That's, that's the biggest challenge that we see in the industry, the fact that when, when cable systems are being monitored, um, you know, especially uh, export cables, uh, there is an insufficient amount of data and monitoring on them, so they can't make effective real-time decisions on, on, on cable assets. Um, and, and also, um, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, historically, there hasn't been any monitoring systems at all, uh, especially from uh, uh, an export, uh, sorry, an inter-array cable perspective. And, and then through evaluating um, the traditional monitoring systems that were available, we concluded that they were just not intuitive enough um, to be able to enable operators and end users to make effective real-time decisions on their cable assets. So developing an intuitive, easy to use user interface with a, uh, a you know, a red, amber, green warning system was, uh, was, was very important. Um, we can give real-time updates on the, the cable asset at any one time to the end user. It's not where to traditional monitoring systems, we have to download the data, hand that off to an independent cable specialist, and then they evaluate the data, send that report back to the end user operator, and then effectively that's that's not you know enabling the operator to, to make real time decisions. Um, so that was a big factor, and and that's the biggest change that I see that ECG can offer the industry compared to traditional monitoring systems. Um, and the topology uh, and the concept for the ECG solution gives BPP cables access to the cable parameter data within ECG, um, including Synaptec's unique passive uh, photonic instrumentation to process uh, you know, the, the data through their inter intelligent learning systems, um, where the real-time analys analysis can enable um, you know, recommendations on how to manage and mitigate faults from occurring on the cable. So it's looking at the degradation of the cable rather than looking at the fault as a, an already happened event, and then you have to react to that event. Um, I suppose 
in conjunction uh, with that and further kind of unique points um, outside of, of fault prediction, it's also the automated cable reports. So we're building functionality within ECG that, um, that distributes automated cable reports to key stakeholders within any operation. Um, so that all of the key stakeholders within within the uh, within the company or within the team within the asset management team are clear and completely knowledgeable on the condition and the integrity of their cable assets. There's no surprises. They have full visibility, and you know more data and the processing and correlation of data is enabling that. And that's exactly what ECG is going to deliver. I don't know if Darren or Tom have got uh, anything further to add to that. Yeah, you have a good place, Paul. Um, just to build on some of the aspects that Paul has mentioned, um, currently the systems which are in place now monitoring cable health um, are very much standalone systems, BES, DTS, um, Lyra, etc. And what we wanted to get away from is to get away from those singular systems and bring them all together in, in one combined system. And um, especially since cable kind of forensic investigation work and feel it, um, BP Pete uh, cables often gets involved a lot with looking back at historical data after cables have gone wrong and then trying to piece together what the history of that failure has been in order to provide a, an answer to the operator or an insurer or a, um, a lawyer who, uh, you know, what, what the causation was and uh, what needs to be put in place to, to mitigate that causation. By doing this, we'll be able to have a technology whereby we can actually see false potential development and actually advise operators on what's going wrong, what potentially need to do to um, change the operating parameters of that cable system, hence mitigating fairly, which um, as some of the other speakers that they have um, alluded to, um, can be very expensive and very time consuming to. We see this as a very much of a transition from a reactive assessment to more of a proactive assessment um, to assist with um, operators in the, uh, the use of these um, complex and very expensive cable system. Yeah, I just add to what Darren is saying, really, it's this combination of all these different technologies, because you get when up to now, it feels that people have just sort of gone with one technology and use those bits of data. And it's really adding all of these bits of data together, getting this big picture. And then from that, and the work BPP is going to do from the data from Synaptic and the other technologies is then yeah, just to start giving that advance warning, learn what those early signs are from these sensors that are indicating faults and hopefully operators can start to be proactive in their um, operations and maintenance rather than just reactive and replacing ca damaged cables. Yeah, another, another thing as well, just to pick up on some of the points that Tom just mentioned, what the, the, another big advantage that the system also gives us is that um, it's going to be continually collecting data and monitoring that data to, to kind of show how the, uh, the cable system is working and performing. And a big advantage of having that big pool of data and um, BPP cables doing the analytical um, data processing and assessment of that data is, we will be able to advise operators on um, potential development risks and also potentially um, give an estimation of residual cable life um, of the asset, which um, at, at present there's no kind of one system that does that. And this will also allow us to kind of issue um, on a, a monthly or an annual basis, depending on what the operator's requirement are, a very detailed automated report with um, input from our experience of cable systems analysis and, and fault investigations give the operator a much more comfort um, will fail on what and how um, that system is, is operating and will operate in the future. That's really good, good, good points, guys. Um, I suppose just, just to add to that uh, as a final point on, on, on this, um, we given kind of where we are on the project um, and we're currently going through the development phase, we'd be really interested to hear from kind of the industry um, who are interested in kind of the next generation of cable monitoring and, and cable management. Um, we're currently looking at um, sponsors for the ECG system to provide, um, you know, co commercial scale uh, demonstration opportunities to prove the ECG system performs against our design brief and our functionality brief. But we're also interested to hear from the insurance industry 
um, to see how um, ECG could could potentially mitigate risk to the uh, to, to insurance uh, policies and associated uh, subsea cable insurance policies as well. I can just see some of the questions coming in um, as we're talking. Um, probably try and jump in and answer some of these where we're talking about you know how traditionally monitoring systems have just been saying the cable has failed i think what ecg is bringing together by including synaptic is there's new ways to monitor systems by looking at things like power quality and the flow of we believe that it's possible to preempt these failures to see failures before that when you're looking at something just with PD or just with DTS, maybe you can only get that idea that the cable has failed. But when you bring these all together, and including, as I've just said, monitoring things like sheaf current and power quality, we really think this is going to bring that monitoring to a whole new level rather than just telling you your cables failed, which is, I think, of limited interest to the industry. It's, um, yeah about taking to the next level. Absolutely. Yeah. Traditional monitoring systems, we know that, 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 that don't capture the, the termination, whereas, you know, with our uh, collaboration and, and, and um, partnership with, with Synaptech, we can have full visibility on the condition, integrity and performance of that, uh, of that uh, cable termination. One of, one of the big advantages of the system as well is that, uh, as Tom mentioned there, the, the user or the operator sitting in a control room remote from the field somewhere can actually see um, the, the measurement of these prompters and um, those would be actually charted on a rolling graph um, with on a time series. So the, the user could actually see how each individual prompter of that cable system is performing. Um, we also are intended to set um, upper and lower control and action limits on those. So once a prompter does start going out of control, one system would flag up to that user and say, look, you know, something's going wrong with your cable system. You now need to about, you know, mod modifying the, the output of that cable system, you know, to bring those um, back into control. But very, it, is, it is very much proactive um, and, you know, it can be seen how things are developing throughout the, um, throughout the course of the operation of the system as well. That's true. Definitely sounds like the aim is to be proactive, it's all about preventative maintenance um, and about providing the evidence space to be able to do that. Um, and, and it's interesting to see how multiple themes have, have come through today um, from Michael before explaining if you could set your own rules for a club and, and one of the standards for joining was to have a system like this, um, yes. you'd have a, a, enough data, enough rules to be able to say if this orange light flashes, you have the go to, to go and go and do prevent, you know, uh, proactive maintenance. Yes, um, absolutely. And, and yeah, you were mentioning um, you're looking to hear from industry. What 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 is next in the development timeline? Um, what enables full commercialization of the product in in the future? Um, more specifically, what what you're looking to hear from industry there? Um, I guess as a part of this sponsorship, there's there's a number of kind of things that we we would like to 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 have contributed to the project. I guess it's um, kind of further understanding of uh, of uh, maintaining and managing a, a cable assets. Um, I think having the in-depth knowledge of an end user operator uh, would go a long way uh, in the development of ECG to ensure that it, uh, the output of the development um, delivers a system that is cohesive and addresses all the needs of the industry. Um, and, and a lot of those needs and, and challenge points we've, we've um, touched upon and discussed already uh, today in, in this webinar. Um, also, you know, in order to enable that commercialization, we need to demonstrate it. So as a part of this 14 month uh, um, uh, development program, at the end of that 14 months, we need to, to demonstrate it on a commercial scale wind farm. Uh, we need to ideally on a, a minimum of one string with a minimum of, of five cables. Um, and then through that 12 months demonstration, really kind of demonstrating the value um, that ECG brings to the industry um, and how we can mitigate faults from occurring rather than a reactive system that tells you your cable has failed. We want to ensure that we can tell end users and operators as and when cable parameters are fluctuating, um, even if it's within their normal operating parameters, if there is a, um, a, a rogue um, 
uh, parameter that is that is fluctuating within the operating uh, limits. We want to enable, um, you know, um, uh, enable a process that alerts the operator that something is going wrong with the cable. Is, is there a link here to, to Electro to, as well that was previously mentioned by, by Charlotte? Um, could, could potentially any information from, from that work be useful in being able to set the parameters that you were talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no secret that, um, that there's an industry challenge, should we say, on the availability of um, anonymized data uh, to the supply chain, of which I believe stifles innovation for various aspects of offshore wind. And I think, you know, cables is, is very much uh, front and center of that. Um, Electrode will enable or, or can enable ECG to be de developed in a way that really um, kind of hits the sweet spot of subsea cable challenges uh, by directly targeting um, the known failure modes and analyzing uh, the process and degradation that takes place leading up to ca cable failures, because that's the important part. It's not the fact that it's failed or it's near to failing, it's the changes in fluctuations of the parameters and identifying when a potential fault could occur. And then that will enable kind of ProServe and our partners in, in Synaptic and BPP to, to mitigate faults and failures and reduce that 80% figure of, of cable failures in the industry um, or, or for, through insurance claims. And, and also give you know owners operators uh, peace of mind that they have full visibility and they're able uh, to make preemptive decisions on their cable assets rather than reactive decisions. Brilliantly. Um, we're getting a couple of questions uh, about, about CPS, very topical at the moment. Uh, is, is, there, um, is there a link to ECG there or is it purely the, the cable and, and terminations and joints on the cable? Yeah, there is a link. Um, I think you could probably imagine as, as this news broke out that there was a, a number of questions on could ECG have been able to pick that up? And I believe yes. And I think that is through the correlation of multiple data points. I think um, certainly the correlation between DAS and um, and the DES from, from Synaptec would have been able to correlate and uh, and make known that there's abnormalities or there's there's um, things happening that are abnormal for um, for that CPS to fail. Um, I don't know if there's anything more you want to add, Darren or Tom. I think it's really with all this technology, because we now have the ability to put sensors right across the wind farm that are measuring synchronously in a cost effective way for the first time, what you can say is you might not know what the data is showing for one point, but if one point on your cable entry system is showing different data to every other one, when you're doing your ROV surveys and things like that, probably the first place you want to go and look at would be the starting point in these systems. And then as we gather more data, as you have failures and then you have the data from that, that's when we can start to, you know, start to learn what signs, you know, what, what bit of the data is telling you um, the failure mode. Absolutely. Yeah, because it is such an early warning system as well, um, it does allow operators to kind of target, um, you know, inspection and maintenance activities, as Tom mentioned there. By doing so, that um, allows them to kind of, um, you know, secure more favourable um, vessel rates, um, you know, the, the resources they want to talk to. Well, so we feel that is another benefit to be um, using the system as well. So it's a preemptive planning tool. You're going to be able to optimize various costs, whether it be, um, you know, maintenance, whether it be um, uh, change outs or whether it be vessels, um, you know, production loss. Um, it just enables that optimization across multiple areas. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Um, I, I think we might we might wrap up there. Um, but really good luck with, with the, the rest of the upcoming projects. I, I, I really hope it, it, it comes off in at least a full commercialization. Uh, in, in my limited opinion, I, I think the market is crying out for something like this. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Dan. And, and thank you to, to all our panelists and, and everyone who joined us today as well. Um, we're going to look forward to continuing the discussions we've had today on Ori Catapult's LinkedIn channel at hashtag cable questions. Sorry, cables questions is plural. Um, but thank you again to everyone today. That's us.
Um, this will be on YouTube afterwards and all presentations will be made available. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.